Can you Welcome. still see me okay? Yes, we can see you. <laughs> Welcome to, uh, to the March 2nd edition of Live Hangouts with Cascadia. I'm your host, Christina Evans, and tonight I'm joined by compliance extraordinaire Suzanne King and customer obsessed product safety master of content wordsmithery Emily Murray. Thank you for joining us tonight, ladies. All right. So this session tonight, today, whatever time you're watching this, uh, wraps up our three-part series on branding and Amazon fulfillment. So if you've attended or watched the previous sessions, you know that I was lucky enough to visit a fulfillment center in Kentucky a few weeks ago and have shared quite a bit about what I learned from that tour in the context of how fulfillment affects brand owners. Um, in the first part, we discussed uh, branding as a marketing exercise, uh, what options Amazon offers to brand owners for marketing and how fulfillment plays into that. <clears throat> in the second session, we did a deep dive into operational aspects of being an Amazon seller with a brand and how Amazon's fulfillment network impacts brand owners that use it. So this week for the final and part three, uh, we'll talk about those sellers who sell other brands and how Amazon's fulfillment network affects them. So as I mentioned before, I thoroughly enjoyed my visit to the fulfillment center. It was so interesting, and I know I keep harping on it, uh, but how Amazon stores products, just rows and rows of random products all stuffed into bins. Um, there's real no real rhyme or reason like you'd see on store shelves, for example. Uh, the only real organization was with um, like suits and apparel um, in the fulfillment center. Um, they were in one area and shoes were in another, but otherwise it's all just random. For our discussion on how Amazon fulfillment impacts sellers of other brands, uh, we'll cover three different aspects of operations. First, how recalls happen and what are the obligations of a reseller. Second, if you are importing another brand's products, what are your obligations and can you ship directly to an Amazon fulfillment center? And third, how can you build a brand if you're reselling somebody else's brand and not your own? Suzanne, in your experience, how do recalls happen? Is it just when there are injuries or a more serious event like a house fire? Oh boy, um, recalls could happen for either of those reasons it doesn't have to be catastrophic so if someone buys a toaster and they report that uh, sparks are flying from an outlet when they plug it in that would be enough to trigger an investigation that leads to a recall um, my experience is mostly with consumer products and food and uh, consumer products would be like anything you'd buy in a Walmart or a Costco or a department store or Amazon. And the governing agency in the United States for all of those items is the CPSC. That stands for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And they are especially on it when it comes to toys or anything for juveniles. So anything that's for a nursery or preschool use or anything for a child under the age of 13, the CPSC has very strict guidelines about. Um, and then on the food end of the spectrum, I've worked a lot with food and supplements and it's completely different agencies that would govern recalls for that. That's FDA, the USDA are the main ones there. Um, and the biggest misperception I've experienced, um, Christina, is that recalls are often called voluntary and that confuses the seller or vendor of a product because they think oh okay that doesn't affect me but they're really not voluntary um so it's kind of a disservice to the citizen that a recall would be called voluntary um as soon as a product does come under scrutiny by an agency it's probably time to recall it um and another misconception that i've run up against is that um, a lot of vendors and sellers think that only a manufacturer is involved in a recall because they made the product, right? And so for someone that sold the product but they don't own the brand, they had nothing to do with the manufacturing of it, they assume they're not included in a recall, but that's not true. There's shared liability. So even if it's not a seller's fault, um, 
if you're selling a product that's part of a recall, you're swept up in it. You have to stop selling it immediately. Otherwise, you, you pose risk of liability for yourself. If later it turns out you kept selling something with the knowledge that it's a safety risk that looks really bad in a court of law. Um, and then another risk is if a manufacturer or a brand owner goes out of business, you can be stuck with a loss because you can't get your money back. So solves for that would be dealing with reputable brands um, or you know if you're creating your own brand work with a third-party lab to get the product tested um, to make sure that you know the wires inside are appropriate or if it's a toy that it's not made out of a plastic that's too brittle and it breaks and creates small parts um, there are all sorts of things an independent lab can do to help mitigate the risk and testing is not as expensive as a lot of people think um, and then another thing that I've seen is that a lot of manufacturers don't mark their products with lot numbers or manufacturing dates. And while that's changed for the toy industry, because for the last four years now, the CPSC has required specific lot number or manufacturing date information on products for juveniles, and it really makes it clear when there's a recall what a limited production run is affected. Um, if no, that's not required on most other products. So a recall then ends up being very wide. And so if a product's been for sale for four years, every unit that's been produced over a four-year period of time would get swept up into that recall. And that just can be really hairy. So for people that have their own private label, um, I often um, urge them, no matter what product category they're in, include a lot number or production date on there if you can, because that can make a big difference if the product is ever recalled. It would make the difference between recalling just one production run or your entire production units for the life of the product. That was a lot of talking. Did I answer your question, Christina? <laughs> you did, and you actually uh, you brought something else to mind when you mentioned um, that it's a lot cheaper to test than what people think. And I yeah. think if um, anyone listening right now, if you could talk to any number of the clients that Cascadia is working with right now with product development and or redevelopment, um, it is significantly less expensive to test your product um, through during production, before production, after production, or pre, um, uh, what's it called, Emily? Pre-production. Yes, well, pre-production. <laughs> or final <laughs> inspection before it's shipped over anyway, before it's imported. Um, it is significantly less expensive than having to deal with a recall. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when I was um, when I was at the Fulfillment Center, I could see that everything was all lumped in together. How would sellers go about making sure that something that was publicly recalled really was the item that was recalled? Okay, so some of this speaks a little bit to what um, Suzanne was just saying, but when I worked in um, product compliance at Amazon, the process was to remove everything. Um, basically, you can't really task a fulfillment center worker with going through and sorting products and making sure that you know certain lot numbers um, apply for example so that's why Suzanne's idea of actually putting a lot number or something um, to identify what's going on with that particular product might not be a bad idea if you can do that um, we just couldn't really um, figure out a way to make it so that the fulfillment center workers could have a checklist by which they could go through and ensure that every single thing for sure um, was taken down. And that's the whole point of a recall. Um, they can't make a mistake and we couldn't afford to allow them to make a mistake. So the only way to do it is to take everything down. So if you're a reseller who's impacted by a recall, you have to assume that your inventory is gonna be locked down until everyone removes their inventory. Um, and only then will Amazon be able to consider reinstating um, the ASINs because it's just too high of a risk. And at the end of the day, Amazon has to bear the brunt of all of the risk. Um, so the only way to do it is to clear everything out of the fulfillment centers and then bring everything back in new. Um, and we would constantly get tickets um, from really upset sellers and they had reason to be upset, you know, um, but they were wanting to sell their compliant product and they were sure that it wasn't part of the recall, um, but we just couldn't guarantee that it actually wasn't part of the recall. And so again, the liability that Amazon holds is just too great 
Um, so they would take everything down. Um, terms of service requires that everything be sent into Amazon compliant and tested and ready to go. And so if there's a recall that happens, the only way to really back out of that is to literally back out of it. Um, remove everything and resend. So sometimes Amazon will choose not to sell a product at all after that, um, even if it hasn't been recalled necessarily, I should say, um, because they have to bear so much um, risk of liability. Um, they're very careful. So when there are problems, uh, complaints, injuries, and things like that, they take them very seriously. Um, I was responsible for a lot of product investigations, doing research to determine if a customer complaint was reasonable, if so, whether we should continue to list the product or not. And in some cases, we just decided not to and did an internal shutdown of the listing because it was just too much liability. And at the end of the day, it was our sandbox. It's Amazon sandbox. So um, if you're going to bring a lawsuit, it's not really going to be against a seller on Amazon. It's going to be Amazon. So um, that was really the whole point. So um, basically what you can expect is all your stuff is on hold for 30 days and then your sellers can, sellers can remove everything and appeal the process and sign uh, Okay, got it. So potentially one slow removal could slow down everything for the rest of the group, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't sound very fair, but being customer obsessed, it makes perfect sense that Amazon always defaults to the customer. <laughs> um, so I want to move to imports and how the fulfillment centers are affected by that. My understanding is that Amazon has an import program and imports directly to their facilities. They do. Um, they directly import many of their items, um, but there are certain products that um, have importer and consignee requirements um, that Amazon um, fulfillment centers can't meet. Uh, medical devices are a great example of this. So those need to be imported elsewhere first, and then they can be shipped to Amazon warehouse. Yeah, actually, let me speak to that because um, I could describe why a seller wouldn't want to import food. First of all, food's governed by the FDA. So the U.S. government requires that an FDA-registered facility be the importer of record. And when I worked at Amazon in the food compliance area, on a weekly basis, I saw notices from the FDA that goods had been shipped from Canada or Europe or Asia directly to an FC or a sort center, and they were caught up by the FDA before they could do that because none of the Amazon facilities are FDA registered and they probably never will be. Um, Amazon's not different than a lot of other companies. They don't want to register if they don't have to because once you're registered with a federal agency, you have to invite those federal agents into your buildings at any time to do any kind of audits or inspections they might want to do. So I don't expect that Amazon FCs will become FDA registered anytime soon. Um, and so therefore there has to be a middleman that's the importer of record. And I know Jennifer uh, Mosier, who works as a, com uh, a trade compliance consultant to Cascadia, can help sellers with um, options for finding a middleman to bring things in. Um, and, you know, it gets a little tricky because I often, at the beginning when I started seeing all those notices from the FDA about stuff that had been stopped at the border, or it would be actually not stopped at the border, it would be stopped at whatever port it came in. And a lot of this stuff comes in by air. And I would think, how does the FDA even know that it's coming in? But they monitor any shipping manifests at the ports. They're looking at the HTS codes, that's the Harmonized Tariff System code for an item, and they know all the codes related to food and supplements, dietary supplements or drugs. And so they're looking for things that fall under those HTC classifications, and then they can arbitrarily seize a container if they see that it's going to a site that's not FDA registered. So that's what happens. And it seems that they're really on it whenever there's a hot topic in the press or the TV news. Um, I can think of a couple of years ago, dog chews coming out of China 
were starting to be a problem. There was a mold growing on some of them that were making dogs sick. And the way they were dried um, chemically rather than mechanically involved chemicals that were also making dogs sick. And so the TV newscasts were covering a lot of issues about dogs. Well, that's governed by the USDA is meat products, but they work like the FDA. They were monitoring the shipping manifests coming in at the ports, and they were arbitrarily seizing those things for inspection. And whenever your container of goods is seized by a federal agency, they have the right to take any of those items and submit them to a lab for testing. They have The FDA has their own labs. The USDA have their own labs. They're near the main shipping ports. And usually within a week, they turn out a report. But it can mean your stuff is held up at the border. Sorry, I talked a lot again. Christina? It's, it's fine. So for some of our clients, um, they may want to stay completely out of the process. So there are options for not even touching these products. Can you repeat that, Christina? Because um, you were breaking up to my ear. Sure. Um, my question was, um, for those who may want to stay completely out of the import process, uh, what are the options for not even touching those those types of products that you were re so the I'll, I'll go back a little bit. So the learning goal for those who are watching is understanding the complexity for mm -hmm. regulatory requirements um, for food and that the FDA does enforce those via the declared HTS code. So for those who want to stay completely out of the import process, mm -hmm. um, what are the options for not even not even touching those type of products? So there are companies um, who will receive the goods on your behalf um, and they'll even repackage and send the shipment on to Amazon when they're done. Um, so two companies that I, can, that I can think of that would do that for you where you could stay completely hands off are um, Zebra Pals and also Flexport. Um, they handle incoming shipments and um, repackaging to ship to Amazon. Okay, so it really can be hands off the wheel kind of business if you have a day job and you're trying to make, thing, make it happen, um, you don't have to ship to yourself. And for non-US based folks, having a destination address here is domestically is a must to make sure that Amazon receives your products, yes? Okay. All right. So we've gone over potential recalls liability and, and how Amazon handles it. And we've talked about importing another brand and your obligations. Um, so now let's talk about branding for resellers. Emily, what are sellers options? Um, so the first question to ask if whether is whether the um, seller has an exclusive agreement or not. Um, if you have an exclusive agreement with a manufacturer, you have the same editorial and brand management rights as the brand itself. Um, and so that's pretty great because you have a lot of control of a lot of things. Um, if you can convince a brand to make you their sole Amazon representative, then that can be a very successful way to break into branding on Amazon. Um, the drawbacks really are around distribution. Um, for some of our clients, their exclusive arrangement is for online only, um, but we know that many sellers do retail arbitrage from stores where the products may be available. Um, so even though you're the only approved online seller, other online sellers may actually be on Amazon due to in-store buys, um, and you really don't have any way to control that. Um, you can certainly send a cease and desist order to them, and many sellers actually will back off if they realize that they're violating some sort of agreement, but just as many don't um, because they know that Amazon prefers not to get into these types of arguments and um, enforce these types of agreements. So that can be a tough one for sure. Um, another area that's really tough is what to include in the box that you're sending. Um, if it's your product, you can include fully um, terms of service compliant literature um, without ever diverting off of Amazon. Um, the proper way is to just list your website without any comment, um, any direction, anything to do with it. You can just list your website um, and any coupons included. 
um, that you want to send to the customer, but they must work on Amazon. So that's an important thing to mention too. Um, many manufacturers make the same products for off of Amazon sales as well as on Amazon sales. So their inserts may not be something that you can actually get away with selling on Amazon. So you need to be really careful. Um, always double check before you put it up for sale since really what it comes down to is it's your seller account. If you're doing something that's against terms of service, that's on you. Um, sort of like what we were talking about with the recalls, you know, recalls, Amazon takes a very um, hard stance against that because it's them on the line. It's their reputation at stake. So you can think of it similar, you know, you don't want to include things in your, in your package that um, would get you in trouble with Amazon because you could end up not being able to sell on Amazon. That's not really worth it. Um, so, and then on the subject of inserts themselves, um, depending on the claims, FDA may actually have some jurisdiction over these things. So, um, basically what that means is that if a device is actually claiming to have some kind of effect on you, if it's claiming to change something about you or do something to you, um, the one thing that I could think of was a TENS machine, um, which has like in those little, um, uh, pads that you stick on your skin and they give you an electrical um, impulse. Um, that device and the claims that it makes are regulated. And I don't know really a ton about imports, um, but I can tell you that the items you're importing have to have an HTS code. Um, HTS stands for Harmonized Tariff Schedule, and that's pretty much exactly what it is. It's a schedule of fees, um, duties, tariffs, um, taxes and things to be levied on incoming commodities. So um, your shipment has to have an HTS classification in order to even land on US shores. Um, so it's already classified, it's already made known what that is. If it's a medical device, it's got an HTS classification to match that. Um, so what that means is if your device is indeed a medical device, because your HTS code says it is, the US or the, at the FDA, um, they have jurisdiction over that, so use caution. <laughs> um, and Suzanne, um, if a client wanted to validate claims that they had found um, before in or listing on Amazon, what would they ask uh, for from the manufacturer then? Well, the process would be different for food or dietary supplements than it would be for medical devices. Um, for medical devices, you really need to check the FDA classification charts. And they're available online. They're really hard to find. Um, but there's a really detailed list of anything that the FDA considers to have some kind of medical benefit. And it's really surprising everything that's on there, like condoms are on there, which when you think about it, yeah, that has a medical benefit. Um, and so uh, a lot of things fall under the FDA classifications. And so they require pre-planning. Um, for non-prescription items, which is what you could sell on Amazon, anything that's prescription only should not be for sale on Amazon. Things creep in, but as soon as Amazon figures that out, they're pretty good at slapping that down and suppressing those ASINs. But for a non-RX item like a condom or even a, a vibrator um, or compression socks that patients would wear or even that nurses or people that stand on their feet would wear. Those are um, regulated by the FDA. And so you have to apply for what's called 510K pre-clearance. And so the good thing about that is, is you can um, file a bunch of paperwork and pay a fee. It's just over $3,000 last I checked. Um, and over. you can, oh, sorry. <laughs> So just over. Yeah, just over. It might be, actually, it might be $3,800 now that I think about it. Interestingly, the fee went down January 1st of 2017. It's a couple hundred dollars less than it was last year to classify, which makes no sense to me, but yay, we'll take that where we can get it. Um, and so if you're a seller and you want to sell a medical device, you have to apply for the 510K clearance. A lot of sellers don't understand that. They think if the factory has applied for that clearance um, in the factory's name that they're covered, and that's good because the factory does have to have the 510 
clearance registration number in their factory name, but whoever the importer of record of that item to sell it in the U.S. also has to register. That's because the FDA can make $3,800 from the seller and $3,800 from the manufacturer, and this is an annual fee. So if you want to start selling any devices that would fall under a FDA classified category, it's worth looking up if FDA clearance is involved because you'd want to run the numbers and make sure you could sell enough units that would make it worth it to pay $3,800 to get your 510 clearance uh, or your registration with the FDA to sell it. Suzanne, and then, yeah. Can't, um, on that topic, um, I know we had this issue with a client last year who mm -hmm. the manufacturer tried to sell them the certification, the 510K mm -hmm. certification, and they bought it. They bought it and then their stuff got seized at port because they didn't have the right certification and wow. battling with them and they ended up calling us and I believe we were able to help them out. We were able to help them out, but um, so can you speak on that? Like, or just yeah. how I say, yes, they, uh, if a manufacturer is trying to sell you their certification, that's not how it works. No, that's not <laughs> how it works. That must've happened before I joined Cascadia. Yes, um, it was. But no, the factory has to register if they're selling to anybody that's going to um, sell the product in the U.S. The factory needs to register. Now, some factories that have the capability to manufacture something and say they're already manufacturing this item for the Asian market or for the European market, and it's already got its approvals there, and the manufacturer might not be so interested in making this medical device for the U.S. market. And so a seller that has experience with selling like items, say, might decide, you know, I totally think that there's a good market for this in the U.S. No other sellers on Amazon are selling it. I'm going to go ahead and pay the manufacturer's costs for doing the 510 classification. Great. But I think a seller should go into that knowing that's what they're doing and then hopefully ironing out some kind of exclusivity arrangement with the factory because a smart factory owner would recognize, oh, I'm certified to make this. Now I can start selling this at trade shows for sale in North America. Right. So there's some business dynamics there that would need to be worked out. Um, but for anybody that's considering selling uh, medical devices or um, supplements, if they're originating offshore, especially, they should just ask the manufacturer, what test reports do you have on hand? And does your factory have GMP certification? That means good manufacturing processes, and it means it's been audited by a third party. There's lots of third party labs and audit companies that will go into a factory, and they look from the beginning to end of the production cycle at everything that's involved. They'll look at the raw materials intake, raw material storage, they'll look at manufacturing processes, they'll look at QC at the end, and they'll look at the cleanliness of the factory overall and the, ex uh, the perimeter of the factory. And if they issue the GMP certification, they're saying, for this year, we have authenticated that this factory is following good manufacturing practices, and therefore, it qualifies for um, approval under the FDA. So um, if you are contemplating buying a medical device that a manufacturer is already selling and you just want to, say, private label it and put it under your own brand name, it's appropriate to ask, what test reports do you have? And then when you get those test reports, look at them. And it, I don't expect a lot of people can read them. That's what I do. Um, but just look at them and see when was it issued. If it's a report that's five years old, that's not recent enough. You need something dated in the last year for it to be valid. And you know that's just a basic thing with a lot of clients I work with. When they send me a whole file of test reports, a lot of it's really old or it doesn't even cover the product we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, it's in another language, but the, the factories don't realize how easy it is to Google Translate a document. And you know I could be looking at a menu for Chinese food. It's, it's not relevant to any of this. Um, so do your homework in advance. That can save you some grief. And then for supplements, if you want to buy any food or supplements, it's really appropriate to ask for a certificate of analysis. Those are often called a COA. And it's appropriate to ask for one from a recent production run. It should be at least within the last year. And it should show a full plate count. That would be an aerobic, 
play count usually for um, E. coli and salmonella and about six other germs that could be in a food or a supplement. And um, typically that COA would refer to a lot number or production date to validate that it's fairly recent. And it would describe the shape of the tablet or if it's a capsule, if it's a gel capsule, it would describe that. And then it would also show an ingredients list. So it kind of validates what the item is. Um, did I answer that question for you? Uh, Emily? <laughs> yes, I okay. think so. Am I muted? Sorry. No, um, I can hear you. Okay. I was just saying, wow, I, I always learn so much from these sessions and all you masters of compliance. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention, and you sort of mentioned it earlier, for mm -hmm. those, if you if you are in the process of importing or developing a product, and you're not using a service that let's say Cascadia provides with product development um, and maybe you're stuck in this process you're not quite sure which way where you need to go next you can request those documents or hire Cascadia to do that for you we handle that whole process for you from A to Z but if you're in the middle of the process and you're just like I don't you know or am I getting messed over I don't know um, call us reach out to us, um, we can uh, talk to, we'll correspond with the manufacturer, the factory, um, the labs, whatever we have to do, uh, review that documentation for you um, and be able to give you next best steps and, and guide you so that you know that you're not being taken advantage of by, by anybody really and make sure that you have the right documentation to import properly a safe and healthy product. So um, to summarize this evening's key takeaways, there was a lot, um, but resellers should be aware of the risks of, uh, risks of selling another brand and potentially losing their ability to resell products if they're recalled or deemed unsafe. Uh, resellers should also understand their obligations if they're importing another brand. Um, and even non-US based resellers can use uh, third party logistics providers to get products to the fulfillment centers uh, without touching it themselves. And lastly, resellers should be cautious about what their manufacturers insert into the box and should try to establish exclusive relationships to better manage the brand on Amazon. Did I miss anything, ladies? Does that sum it up? Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. As always, thank you so much for joining us. If you have any questions for our Hangouts, uh, either before or after, feel free to post on our Facebook page, um, facebook.com slash thinkcascadia. You can always email us at info at thinkcascadia.com or you can call us 206-202-0222 and pretty much 24-7 I'm available via Skype at Think Cascadia. We will be at the Sellers Conference, formerly known as SCO, in Philadelphia next week. Um, I, myself, will be speaking on how brand owners can work backward from customer feedback to prevent suspension issues using compliance tools. We love sharing our knowledge and, and helping sellers prevent catastrophic catastrophic events uh, like suspension so they can keep selling. And please, if you're there, find us, introduce yourself. We'd love to meet you face to face. And that's it for this session. Join us again next Thursday for more seller adventures with Cascadia. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.